उस पर एक हमारे सर शेयर करते हैं बात वो मैं यहाँ शेयर करना चाहूंगा कि अगर आपका बेटा लायक है तो बहुत अच्छा लेकिन अगर नालायक है तो उससे भी अच्छा आप कहेंगे कि यार ये क्या बात कर रहे हैं भाई लायक है तो वो अपना आप को छोड़ के चला जाएगा ये तय बात है और आप देख लीजिए कि हम मतलब मैक्सिमम केसेस के अंदर पेरेंट्स आर लिविंग अलोन एंड दी चिल्ड्रन दे हैव दे आर डूइंग एक्स्ट्रा ऑर्डनरी वेल क्यों क्योंकि वो लायक बन गया बन गए और अगर नालायक है वो जा ही नहीं पा रहा एटलीस्ट ही इज स्टेम विद डेम ही इज हेल्पिंग इन विद डेम तो इसीलिए वो कहा कि लायक है तो अच्छा नालायक है तो उससे भी अच्छा कम से कम आपकी सेवा तो करेगा आपके साथ तो रहेगा ना अच्छा जो बाहर निकल गया लायक बन गया उसको प्रॉपर्टी की भी चिंता नहीं है कि पापा मुझे नहीं चाहिए आपकी प्रॉपर्टी हाँ अरे आप तो यहाँ जाओ मेरे साथ छोड़ो वो घर भर मुझे कुछ नहीं चाहिए तो देट इज अंट सिन कोई नहीं चाहेगा मैं इसीलिए कह रहा हूँ ये उन्होंने बोला था कोई नहीं चाहेगा इसलिए लायक ही बना था लेकिन सर जो कह रहे थे कि अगर नहीं बनता उसके लिए खराब ना बोले तो नालायक है तो ये बात थी एक्चुअल उनका प्रैक्टिकल एक्सपीरियंस कि वो और भी अच्छा ही कम से कम साथ तो रहेगा एंड आई हैव सीन सम ऑफ दी फैमिलीज देयर दी सन वाज नॉट एबल टू डू समथिंग ही इज हेल्पिंग दी पेरेंट्स इन ऑल वेज एंड दी लायक इज सन देयर एंजॉयिंग विद देयर वाइफ एंड चिल्ड्रन एंड ऑल दैट Yes, sir, please. खुद को खुद क्या सच है यस सर यस सर सेम सेम आई कोर्ट यस सर वो वही सीखेंगे सर जो हम कर रहे हैं यस सर बिकॉज हाँ बच्चों के बच्चों के एग्री आई टोटली एग्री सर बच्चों के जो आइडियलिस्टिक हैं आइडियल है दे आर दी पेरेंट्स सन जो है वो अपने फादर को देखता है बेटिया जो है अपने मदर को देखती है वो क्या कर रही है यस एग्री सर यस सर है सर अगर मैं 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 अपने बुजुर्गों के पैर छू रहा हूँ तो बच्चा देखेगा वो मेरे छुएगा मेरे बुजुर्गों के भी छुएगा तो वो वही सीखेगा जो मैं कर रहा हूँ सर टोटल बर्निंग इशू है एक्चुअली Yeah. 
Permission of the chair, Kanagwal sir. Kanagwal sir. With the permission of the chair, I would like to announce uh, one thing here. Uh, as our uh, president of PEPMED is here, we are also organizing uh, this conference on the 12th November. So all respected seniors and all delegates are invited in that. Uh, we are conducting it in a, in a hybrid way, and uh, we are having a rider for that. That. Within the 300 kilometer, if you are there, you have to attend it physically. And beyond that, it can be allowed for the online. So basically, we are uh, desiring that you all please come and join us in Swatinda. Uh, that is the test met on, on the 12th November. And uh, President Sir, Dr. Kanawa Sir, is with me. On the same day, the CME has also been organized at SKS in New Delhi. And I am very thankful to Dr. SK Varma and Dr. Moti, sir. I requested them, sir, if you see the date, the date is November 2022. And when I requested them on the same day, they made the alternate arrangement and they postponed their CME for about one week. And now they'll be holding their CME on 19th November 2022, for which I am highly thankful to both of you, sir. Here, I would like to highlight one issue that AIMS Delhi, it is the biggest institute in India, and getting an OD for a particular date, it right. is a tough job. And if you are rescheduling that, again, it is a kind of something yes, impossible. But uh, somehow, with our luck and with it's the efforts of, of the Burma sir and Murti sir. Murti sir, it happened, and we are uh, really humbled, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
nicely covered topic by sir uh, crime rate uh, elders uh, sir ko maine jab call kiya ki sir ye wala topic hai theek hai jab bole aap batao maine jo aapko sahi lage dekh lo sir pehle nahi jab jaisa bolo aap theek hai na maine kaha sir ye wala topic hamara balance ho raha hai crime against elders it yeah, definitely i will prepare it so i am thankful to dr khilesh patel sir hai na we will be definitely be there at bathinda hai yes, na sir हाँ वो गाने भी कही है सर बठंडे पे तो है ना वही सुनेंगे या सुनाएंगे पर मैंने भी सुना था कि चंबे जाना जरूर तो मैं भी चंबे आ गया बठिंडा भी आएंगे सर <laughs> शिमला ना जाना कसौली ना जाना चंबे जाना जरूर तो प्लीज कम टू बठिंडा ऑल्सो थैंक यू सो मच सर इट वाज एन आई एम ग्रेटफुल फॉर ऑल द टाइम एंड and we can make a change as a person so for this i would like to invite a chair person to felicitate our guest speaker please doctor uh, please doctor ranjan prasad and doctor david uh, mola please felicitate our guest speaker doctor akhilesh patel Please give a huge round of applause for our guest speaker. I would also like to call uh, Dr. Ashok Chandra from Kinsmani Medical College, Pathan Kot, to felicitate our chair person for the session. Dr. Ashok Chandra. So please felicitate our chair person. Give a huge round of applause for our chair person. so moving ahead with the next session the topic for this role of consent in medical practice and for this i would like to invite dr s chand professor medical college hapur and dr ak thakur senior advocate samba so please come on the dais and share the session Sir, I would request to call our guest speaker. Puja, jaldi. Phone from medical. Sir, I would like to invite Dr. Nitinan Kumar, Assistant Professor Jhakar. Sir, please come forward to chair the session. I would like to invite our guest speaker, Dr. C. C. Bhai Sora, Principal GMC Almoda. So please come on the stage.
Hello. A very good morning to all of you. Uh, sir, my topic for today is consent in medical practice. This topic is mainly for the undergraduate and postgraduate student. Now, uh, in uh, routine practice, you have to take the consent. And what is the consent? What are the different types of the consent? <coughs> and how to take the consent? <laughs> then, what is the consent? The consent can be defined as an agreement compliance or permission given voluntarily without any compulsion and it should be uh, free, free and voluntary. And as per the section 13 Indian Contact Act, the definition of consent is two or more persons are set to consent uh, when they agree upon the same thing in <coughs> Now, uh, why we take the consent? Uh, usually the consent taken for the examination, treatment, investigation, and collection of the evidences. And consent shows respect for the privacy and dignity of the patient. And this consent protects legal action. If the consent is taken uh, uh, informed consent, then the consent protects legally legal action in case of medical negligence. Now, uh, there are different types of the consent, uh, main implied consent or, and express consent, then informed consent, surrogate consent, and advanced con uh, consent. Now, one by one, uh, what is informed consent? No. Uh, uh, for the informed consent, uh, suppose if the patient is admitted in hospital and is going for surgery, then you have to dis uh, disclose everything to the patient. Uh, this informed consent is defined as a voluntary acceptance after full understanding by a competent patient of a plan for the medical care. <coughs> after the physician uh, should uh, disclose the, all the facts about the uh, what are the procedure for the surgery, what are the uh, benefits and risks, and what are the its alternative approach of the treatments. The decision making capacity is free from the manipulation by both the parties. Now, there, <coughs> there are the vital components regarding the informed consent like mental capacity of the patient to enter into a contract, the complete information should be provided by the doctor uh, before taking any procedure. <laughs> the consent should be uh, procedure and <laughs> it should be no. Uh, there is express uh, consent. It may be oral or verbal. But the written consent has superior evidence value. Now, the implied consent. Suppose a, a patient came to our OPD. It is supposed to be uh, he or she is giving the consent. Uh, this, but this consent is limited for the inspection, palpation, uh, percussion, and auscultation only. Now, surrogate consent. It is given by the family member for the minor or the dead. Adva advanced consent, it is given by the patient in advance uh, before death. Now, there are some other type of consent, proxy con consent, 
when a person is incapable of giving express consent, a substitute consent may be taken from the next of the kin. Uh, that may be spouse, adult child, parents, sibling, and any lawful guardian may be there. <clears throat> This, uh, uh, for the doctor or the RMP, this informed consent is the best uh, defense and the informed consent obtained after ex explaining all the possible side effects, risks, and is superior to all other form of the consent and it is legally def defensive. Now, uh, there are some terms, local parentis, suppose. Uh, uh, suppose the, a picnic uh, of the school children goes and suddenly there is some uh, problem in the children, then the consent may be given by the school teacher or suppose if there is any problem in the hostel, the hostel warden may, be, may give the consent and this loco parentis, this is known as loco parentis consent. Now, the bl blanket consent this consent is invalid in the court of law. Uh, usually some hospital take the blanket of consent. Just like we will take everything. I am giving consent for everything. All type of the treatment, all type of the procedures, all type of the invest, investigation. But this consent is invalid in the court of law. The, cons the consent should be specific for the procedure. It should be specific for the treatment, etc. <clears throat> Now, the who can give the consent? Huh. Uh, uh, as well, section 11, Indian Contact Act, who is age of the majority, who is of the sound mind, and not disqualified from contacting by any law. Now, as well, section 87, IPC, uh, at the, uh, for the medical procedure, which involves the risk of the life done for his benefit, like surgery, anesthesia, etc., the age of 18 years or above age can give the consent. At for section 88 IPC, the 12 year or more than 12 year of age can give only for the general physical examination, diagnosis, and treatment where the risk is not involved. <clears throat> As per section 89 IPC, uh, when uh, the child is below a uh, 12 year of age or the mentally ill person of any age, the parent or the local guardians or the legal guardian may give the consent for the treatment. Now, when to take the consent? Uh, any procedure beyond the routine physical examination, you have to take the written con uh, consent, like for the collection of the blood, blood in case of blood transfusion, any surgical pro procedure is involved, any anesthetic procedure is involved, any complicated therapeutic procedures, administration of the drugs, and for the collection of the evidence, etc. And uh, the consent should be taken in presence of the any third party or by the witness. The witness may be the relative or the friend of the patient. And if both are not present, then uh, you have to take the consent in presence of the nurse or the receptionist of the hospital. Uh, and for the ingredient of the consent, uh, for disclosing any concern, uh, the nature of his or her ailment or the disease process should be there and available treatment, the plan for the proposed line of the treatment, any risk involved, and the, any alternative uh, treatments, and what are the prognosis for the um, case, and relative chances of success or the failure. Uh, 
there are some cases where the consent is exempted like when the patient came in comatose or in unconscious condition and when there no relative or the guardian available for the patient and who cannot give the valid consent there is lack of the time to take consent if uh, in case of the best interest of the patient suppose uh, a patient came in the casualty and he is having the severe head injury or any uh, other internal organs injury and no one is there then in that case you may uh, do the procedures and in case of medical legal cases brought by the police as per section 53 crpc for issue of the certificate for insurance policies and person suffering from diseases under not notified category the prisoner and examination under court order in these cases the cons consent is exempted no uh, what precaution you have to take you have to take the consent in presence of the any witnesses and if the uh, person is illiterate then you have to take the left thumb impression or the right thumb impression of the witness <laughs> now uh, for the medical uh, examination the informed consent or informed refusal must be taken exception like arrested person accused or in drunkenness case for the medical legal uh, autopsy for the medical legal autopsy there is no need to take the consent but in pathological autopsy the consent of the relatives required now there are some legal provisions like section 53 crpc in criminal cases the arrested person can be examined by the doctor without his consent or even using some reasonable force and the section 54 ibc in this case the arrested person can also be can also request to be examined by the doctor to detect any evidence which he feels is good for him uh, for section 87 ibc a person above 18 year of age can give consent to suffer any harm if the act is not intended and not known to cause death or the grievous hurt 87 ibc there are 18 89 ibc a child under 12 year of age or a person of unsound mind cannot give consent to suffer any harm for which may be caused grievous hurt or death even if done in good faith but the uh, local guardian or the parents can give consent in that case in section 90 ibc the consent given by the insane person or given under the fear of the injury death or by the minor or due to misconception of the fact is invalid there are some consent which are invalid is wrong when the consent was given by the insane person or it is given under the fear of the injuries or the death or due to misconception of the fact is invalid uh, section 92 ipc <clears throat> now any harm caused to a person in good faith even without the person's consent is not an offense if the circumstances were such that it is impossible to obtain the consent of the person suppose in case of suppose if the person a unconscious or the severely injured person came to the hospital then you can do the procedure this comes under section 92 ib now uh, there are some condition where the consent of the both husband and wife is required like in case of permanent sterilization and in case of artificial insemination but for the temporary con contraceptive measures uh, there is no need of consent of the spouse 
but the consent for mtp or medical termination of pregnancy only the pregnant mother consent is required if she is more than 18 year of age and if she is minor or the insane then you have to take the consent from the guardians or the parents <clears throat> now in case of victim of the rape suppose if the victim of the uh, sexual assault came to you then you have to take the consent for the treatment examination and for the collection of the evidence or the investigation now suppose uh, sometime what happens uh, they give a uh, consent for the treatment down they are not giving the consent for other thing like collection of the uh, evidences etc then you have to note down in your report the refusal consent also the refusal consent is also equally important <clears throat> now what uh, if the consent is not given and is refusal or incomplete consent is there then this is absolute bar for the examination and treatment for examination and treatment you have to take the valid consent now if the if then you may be charged using of the criminal force assault you may be charged for the professional misconduct medical negligence etc <clears throat> now if incomplete consent or the no consent then you may be charged for the assault attempting to initiate an examination without actually touching the patient body without his or her consent you may be charged for the criminal force ending an in examination of the person with touching of the his or her body without his or her consent now uh, what are the other uh, you may be charged for the professional misconduct you may given the warning notice the temporary removal of the name of the doctor from the state medical council or the permanent removal of the name of the doctor and this is also known as a professional death sentence now uh, you may be charged for the medical negligence if you are examining or giving the treatment without consent thank you sir. <clears throat> thank you very much sir for beautifully illustrating the importance of consent in medical practice I will request to Thank you, sir.
moving ahead, now our session on the topic Plastic Mass Disaster from an Oncologist Perspective. And I'm very proud to uh, announce the chairperson for the session, Dr. Alvin, Professor UCMS, and Dr. Jupendra Kumar Jhakar, Professor of Forensic Medicine, uh, PGIM in Sri the guest speaker for this session would be joining us online, and she's from Nepal. Um, with a round of applause, please welcome Dr. Samarika Dhawan from Nepal. Ma'am, we are making you the host. You can share the screen now. Can I start? Can I start or? Yes, ma'am, you are already going on. Yeah, ready? Can I start? <laughs> yes, yes ma'am, you can start. Yeah, thank you. Good, Good morning. Good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Samari Kadaha, all the way from Nepal. So I'm today I'm going to talk about tackling mass disaster and odontologist perspective. So during any mass disaster, the key is preparedness. The key to success lies in preparedness. If we are not prepared enough, we will never be able to handle things properly and we'll never be able to identify these bodies and hand it over to their loved ones. So as you already know, there are various phases of DVI operation, anti-mortem, post-mortem, reconciliation, and debriefing. So preparedness has to be there in all the aspects. So as we all know, anti-mortem is the data that we collect before the death or the information that was present before the death of an individual or the missing person. So when we prepare for the anti-mortem team, as we already ass we assign uh, groups for the anti-mortem, post-mortem and reconciliation. So for preparedness, if you are a part of the anti-mortem team, there's certain protocol that you have to follow and prepare it beforehand. So for anti-modern preparation, you should always elect a family in fa elect a person for a family interview who is calm and composed, short temper person, and person who cannot stop, and people who can who intimidates others. Others should not be selected for anti-modern preparation. The people the anti-modern interviewer should always be calm and composed because these people are going to make a significant difference to the families. They should know, basically they should know when to stop, not to ask leading questions and be okay to interview the family again tomorrow if needed. They should also be, so during preparedness, another important component is printing the forms. We all know anti-modern forms are yellow in color. So you should print it beforehand and keep it ready in case of any disaster happen. Because after the disaster occurs, you do not want to spend all your time printing files, looking for papers and documenting things. All you want, you want to keep it everything ready. So when time comes, you can just remove it. You can take it out of the shelf and start doing your work. And also arrange a multicolor pen to fill in the forms. So these are various cases that I've done over the years. And you can see that this is how anti-mortem forms come. And this, uh, this is a photograph from US Bangla air crash. You can see that when the family photograph of this individual came in, the anti-mortem interviewer told me that, ma'am, this is of no use to us. But when I saw the photograph, I said, this is enough to send him home. So you can see that there's a crown that can be seen, a smiling photograph. Another photograph, you can see a notch in the incisor. And in this, there's a gapping in between the teeth. Something small evidence such as gapping between the teeth also makes a significant difference. Then another one, you can see a gap between the two teeth and see the, uh, see the structure of the teeth. This looks like a butterfly appearance. 
Then we have another one here. You can see that the one of the premolar is slightly placed in. Such small information also make a small significant difference. So as an odontologist, anything and everything that is involved with tooth can make a significant difference. Sometimes we can even see, I've done cases where we've also see superimposed the structure of the teeth and identified an individual. This is one of the most unfortunate even where seven families of the same, seven members of the same family lost their lives in one of the air crashes. Here, we did not have evidence of the dental, dental evidence, but what made significant difference to them, the clothing, their belonging. So along with these secondary information and their fingerprints, we were able to identify them and send them home. Then comes the another important component, which is postmortem. Postmortem examination is the examination that we do it in the mortuary. Now, for the it's very important that we prepare ourselves for the disaster. Most of the times, a postmortem are not able to store bodies. I remember in Nepal earthquake, we, there were four hundred bodies which came in, and we did not have a place for storage of the bodies. So they were just kept in the open spaces. So for the next disaster, after that, in collaboration with the ICRC, now we have a storage room which can store up to 200 bodies. So I think in India also, NADR is working forward to store bodies in case of, in case of any unfortunate event that occurs over a period of time. So there's certain preparation we need to do in the mortuary that there should be enough number of scrubs. I remember in one of the event, I went in and there was no scrubs. I couldn't find the PPE. So we had to go down, buy it and wear it. So you do not want that to happen. And it's extreme, extreme pressure when such event happens. And there are embassies, there are ministries, there are so many, the pub public who surrounds the entire mortuary and wait for, the, for them to, for us to hand over the bodies. So you do not want to go out and do these things and waste time. We should also check in the instrument and equipment regularly that is needed for the operation, such as check for scalpel blades. And, we'll, and one of the most important small component is socks, wearing socks inside the boots. You must be wondering why socks comes in the mortuary because there are sometimes as decomposed bodies come in and there are a lot of maggots in the bodies. You do not want those maggots to go inside your body. Another important component is nominating person who's going to work for you in your absence. Remember, we are human, we, can, we might get sick, we might, there might be an emergency, there might be so many things that can happen. So you do not want your entire operation to wait for you. So you should always find a person who's going to work for you in your absence. And also when you travel, you should nominate a person beforehand and tell, inform that in case of my absence, this person is going to cover the operation if needed. And you should also find a place where you can sit after your work because you have to work for 10 to 12 days and you do not want to stand all day because it's very uh, there's a lot of pressure in the air and you want to sit down and relax. So this is one of the operations we did. And like we said before, we were not prepared. So when the body started coming in, there were a lot of bodies already in the mortuary. So what we had to do was did our identification in the corridor outside the mortuary. So obviously there was no light. So we had to work in the corridor. So this is Dr. Alistair Soon who came down from Australia to work with us during Nepal earthquake. This is Dr. Nitin Agrawal, my husband, who's a forensic anthropologist. So we were working in the corridor. The other level of preparedness we also do during the disaster, like as rituals, Hindu rituals. This is one of the preparedness. I think of all the bodies belong to Hindu family. So this is the preparation they were doing to hand up before handing over the bodies, covering them properly according to the rituals. I remember during US Bangla air crash, there were half of the individuals were Muslim. So we even called him Maulana and he even chanted the <coughs> their religious, uh, mantras and we also did everything that had to be done and wrapped them according to the Muslim culture and handed over to the bodies. This is the preparation we are doing for the collection of DNA fingerprint. This is for the swab for the DNA collection. And see, this is one of the another important component during tackling of mass disasters, loss of lack of preparedness. Here you can see the photograph, the number is for bigger than the 
photograph. It is because I, it is because we were not prepared at all. So we did not know how to photograph it. So you should also have a person ready who's going to photograph in, because odontologists, they work in pairs. One is examining the body, another is busy writing. So you also need a third person who's going to photograph whatever things you find. Then we have the reconciliation where the antemortem is mashed with the postmortem. This is a very difficult procedure and there's a board which comes in contact. There's a board that is needs to be formed where the board is going to decide whether the person has been identified accurately or not. Like I showed you, you can see the photograph here. There's a teeth that is seen in smiling photograph, which was obviously visible during the postmortem examination. Similarly, you can see the gap between the teeth, which is also present here. So this is how we used it for the, remember, this was a close disaster. We already knew that there were certain amount of individual present in the disaster. So it was able to identify based on one point of agreement. Had this been open disaster, we would have probably kept it as possible. Again, the notch here, you can see the notch here. So another important component during tackling mass is coordination. It's very, very important that we coordinate with each other and we know our limitation. We should not go and roam around in the mortuary until and unless we are asked to do so. As an odontologist, I only step in the mortuary when they finish with the work and they ask me to come and do the dental examination. So this is how the mortuary works. We have changing area mortuary, we have anti-mortem reconciliation. And just because I am free, I don't have in the mortuary, that doesn't mean I go to the anti-mortem area and start chatting with the people, or I go to the container area, area and see what's happening. We do not want that to happen. We do not want we do not want our subconscious mind to know about the other individuals, dead people, so that we do not end up doing wrong identification because when your when your subconscious level has a lot of information, we tend to be biased. So, like I said before, the coordination is very important. Odontology only comes after there's a photograph, there's a external belonging, that fingerprint. Then they have the postmortem examination and odontology comes in the end. I, so we should only step in when they ask us to do our work. We never go in between before and do our work because it, it causes lots of havoc, a lot of confusion, which we do not happen. We do not want to happen. So that is me working in the mortuary. So there's a lot of information that comes in during the um, reconciliation. So it should be systematic. Everything should be filed together. You do not want your loose files and be confused. So it's very important that there's somebody who should take charge of this and coordinate with each other. So this is one during the Tara air crash. You can, you can see the families have started coming in. There are very less people. Now see the mass has increased. That there should be a person who should be talking to the individual. This is Dr. Tulsi Cardell, head of the Department of Forensic Medicine in our Institute of Medicine. This is the guy from the airlines who's trying to talk to people. So a lot of people come in, a lot of people go. So there should be coordination and integration, and there should be somebody who should take care of all this. See, there are a lot of people coming in. Here again, there are a lot of people coming in. See the mass who's come, and there's a dead body which is they are coming and waiting with the ambulance to take their loved ones. So there are, see, there are a lot of bodies which has been lined up waiting to go. This has been identified and now they are going to be handed over to the family. So you do not want the public to come in, nor do you want to go out. So there should be a coordination mechanism which has to be maintained. So these are the external belonging of an individual. You can see that it's been packed properly and ready to go. Another important component is media management. We seem, we seem to work um, against the media. And so you should be very careful with these media. If you do not hand them properly, handle them properly, it's going to create news and you're going to be all over the news, which you do not want to happen. So you should work with media and not against the media. You can see a small holes here. We've been covering it because there's a lot of people waiting outside. To, with the camera so that they can take a glimpse of what's happening inside. So these are the bodies. See, they've managed to take a glimpse from this small place of the hole inside. 
So this is how this student give us Bangladesh. As you can see the number of people who's come in, look at this. Whole lot of whole world is waiting for you to finish your DVI operation, hand them over the bodies. I remember when we finished our postmortem examination and when we went out, people were asking, are you the doctor? I was doing postmortem, are you the doctor? We were so scared of the mob. We said, no, we are not the doctor. So it's very, very important, very, very careful working with these people. And you should know where to stop, how to hide yourself, how to camouflage. There's so many skills that you should learn when you do DVI operations. This is again hand during the handling over the bodies. You can see a whole lot of public waiting outside. This is the uh, press briefing that is Dr. Pramod Shrestha, head of the department then during US Bangla air crash. He's doing the press briefing during this session. You can see a whole lot of people around him asking 101 questions. But as so he's been doing this for years, so he had a paper ready and he already, he only read the news that he wanted to flash out. Other than that, he did not answer any questions to the media. Handling pressure, there's a lot of pressure, pressure from the ministry, pressure from the government, pressure from the embassies, all the embassies come in and they say that, I want to take my body, I want to take my citizen's body, give me the body. So they are not in a situation to be, they're not beyond visual recognition. So they can, so even then they insist on taking certain bodies. So you should know how to handle such pressure. Another pressure is moral obligation. The families come with the, you can see the van all decorated, everything to take the loved ones for the final rights to the, to the, uh, to the temple or ghat. But you can see that uh, we're still in the middle of the postmortem examination, not started with reconciliation and the, they are already waiting for us to finish our work so that they can take the body. There's a lot of moral pressure on you. On top of that, there are a lot of people around the world who come with you and to work with you and take the citizens back. So you should know where, how to work with them, how to stop them, what are, the, what are the things you want them to do, what are the things you do not want them to do. That should be clear in what, black and white paper during handling mass disaster or else they're going to take over and before you knew that it was going to be news all over the world. This is the team from Bangladesh who came during the US Bangla air crash. Another important component I would like to say that respecting the family decision. This is a case of a, a Ethiopian airline crash where a young Nepalese girl lost her life in Ethiopia. And the families, um, the Interpol had contacted me to help them with the anti-mortem data collection. When I did so, the families told me that they are not interested to taking over the bodies and uh, they can do their final rituals in Ethiopia. And they've already done their final rituals here. I've already said, we did a farewell and given uh, farewell from their side here in according to Hindu rituals and they did not take the bodies and they moved on. So there are some times that you should let them go. You should respect the family's decision and go with them. And not just because we've been given and task to identify and hand over the body. You cannot impose, we cannot impose our ideas to the families. Thank you. This finishes my short presentation. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you, ma'am. There are no more questions. Thank you, ma'am, for taking the picture. Thank you, ma'am. 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 Thank you,
Thank you, sir. Now the topic for the next session is ethics in medical practice. So I would like to call our two persons, Dr. Gurmukhi Roy, joining us online, and Dr. Joginder Singh, orthopedician for Sharpur, to kindly speak to you and advise and introduce our guest speaker. So the guest speaker is Dr. Mukesh Yadav, Principal Rani Durgavati Medical College, Banda, Uttar Pradesh. हेलो 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 ये ऑडिबल Hello. Am I audible? Yes, sir. So may I start? Yes, sir. You can start, sir. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sharing my slide. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Is it visible? My slide is visible. Yes, sir. It is visible. so again i uh, thank dr pradeep for giving me opportunity to present this guest lecture on the topic ethics in medical practice which is uh, very much related to the theme medical practice and ethics i am working currently as principal at rani durgavati medical college banda up so i would like to discuss this topic under these following headings what are the cardinal principles of medical ethics concepts of duties and rights terminology of ethics in medical practice roles of various stakeholders in ensuring ethics in medical practice few case study and lastly is there any role of ethicom module of an mc in ensuring ethics in medical practice in new generation so most of us are aware of these basic four principles of ethics that is autonomy beneficence non maleficence and justice the any practitioner who is involved in practice his concern to be ethical should be based upon these basic four principles there are other principles also in modern time but basically they govern the decision whether you are ethically practicing your medicine or not and few regulations since 2002 indian medical council professional conduct etiquettes and ethics regulation 2002 and now it is in a draft stage in 2022 and mc is uh, replacing this document has taken public view prepared that document and maybe in few months or next year we will have another document on the ethical practice 
various regulatory body previously medical council of india now national medical commission and at the state level state medical council and their decisions help in deciding whether you are practicing as a ethical physician or not certain case law supreme court and high court they are the guiding force for deciding whether it is a case where there is any violation of medical ethics or not so i will divide my the topic into two parts one is medical practice and another is ethics because until unless we are not understanding the context we are not able to understand this concept of ethics in medical practice because many thing you have read in your textbook but that is only theoretical part so most of the doctor in india they practice either as a individual physician or they are practicing a group medical practice in form of polyclinic nursing home corporate hospital medical college hospital district hospital etc etc medical practice in government hospital when we divide it into hospitals which are governed by the government run by the government and the hospital which are governed by the private hospital because this scenario will change in the same case when the patient reached in any of these stages many physician they practice as generalist only mbbs doctor as a specialist they have done md ms or dnb and super specialist whether they have completed their dm mch etc so these are the factor which decide in which context it is ethical or not similarly ethic from ethical point of view we have to understand the terminology most of the time we use the word professional misconduct unethical practices criminal offense so these three terminology interchangeably used in our vocabulary when you go through the regulation 2002 the title is indian medical council within bracket professional conduct etiquettes and ethic regulation 2002 so what does it mean because the decision of ethics in relation to medical practice is about the conduct of doctor in relation to patient in a particular situation so we have to understand the difference between these three terminology basically three there are other terms also used what is called professional misconduct what is called ethical practice or what is criminal offense so according to me professional misconduct is a generic term which includes both unethical practices and the criminal offense i will highlight how i am come to this conclusion because that ethical regulation 2002 talk about the professional misconduct etiquettes and ethics and it has eight chapters and each chapter has specifically defined particular duty either of the doctor in particular situation general duty of the doctor then duty of doctor to the patient duty of doctor to the paramedical person duty of doctor in consultation duty of doctor to the other professionals and chapter 6 deals with unethical practices so in strict abstract sense only that chapter is called unethical practices while chapter 7 deals with the professional misconduct and where there are almost 22 to 24 instances mentioned which are called professional misconduct and chapter 8 deals with the uh, provision of disciplinary control and punishment when anybody indulge in unethical practices or professional misconduct another thing which is used in consumer protection act context and that is deficiency in service anything which is not as per the standard either due to infrastructure or due to equipment or due to the manpower manpower is not qualified those are cases where deficiency in service come into picture 
when case reaches to the either district consumer court, state consumer court, or the national consumer court. So they are also professional misconduct, unethical practices, or not. Say, for example, any doctor indulge in advertisement which is not as per the chapter six of the ethical regulation two thousand two. So prima facie, if it is not as per that regulation chapter six, it amounts to deficiency in service in consumer court. And when you go to the chapter seven, professional misconduct, which in its opening sentence has said any violation of previous regulations, that means any violation of regulation chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, four, five, and six. they amount to professional misconduct so what does it mean unethical practice is also professional misconduct yes. in broader sense similarly any case of deficiency in service medical negligence may be civil may be criminal they are also falling under the category of professional yes. misconduct this terminology is very important to understand most of us especially student pg and those who have not uh, read this topic with case law not able to understand this difference between two so according to me professional mr conduct is a general term generic term which includes unethical practices deficiency in service and criminal offenses also now in strict sense which we have been taught what is ethics ethics is the rules body of rule prepared by group of physicians for their benefit for maintaining the nobility of the profession for the benefit of the patient since it is a very highly technical issue so only professional can decide what is good what is right for the patient because they are the more intellectual more knowledgeable with that knowledge and experience so from that point of view it is important to understand these terminology and only body of doctor can take action against the either professional misconduct or unethical practice and what are those bodies at the state level it is usually state medical council at the central level in appeal or maybe directly say for example in union territories where there is no state medical council or even delhi where doctors are registered directly with the medical council of india or nmc so who will who is the regulatory body for that obviously national medical commission under the new board ethics and medical registration board which is specially dealing with registration of doctor which authorizes doctor to practice medicine and uh, obviously action taken against as per the violation of this ethical regulation 2002 as on today because after national medical commission act 2019 whatever regulation existing previously they are part of nmc and nmc until unless they are not replaced or repealed by the nmc they will exist still as legal force so you be have to understand uh, state medical council ethics medical registration board and nmc they can take action for professional misconduct or unethical practice if any complaint made in writing along with procedure which is defined in state medical council most prevalent violation of regulation 2002 or professional misconduct or unethical practices nowadays which i gone through either reading newspaper or watching news in the electronic media this is advertisement putting photograph on the advertisement content of the advertisement which are not as per the standard prescribed or content approved by the ethical regulation 2002 practice related to medical record chapter 1 has many regulations maintaining of medical record is compulsory keeping of preservation record as per regulation for 3 year of ipd patient is necessary any request received from the patient for receiving of record it has to be given within 72 hours it is a mandatory thing and these cases reached up to the supreme court and where supreme court endorsed yes these are the mandatory regulation and one has to not only maintain the medical record as per the ethical regulation 2002 as there is appendix 
which has mentioned minimum content for the medical report. Similarly, consent, very well taken by Dr. C.P. Basoda in his lecture. Medical certificate. Recently, it has been now trained the medical certificate, they are either fake or not prepared as per ethical regulation. So they are also falling under the category, not only uh, unethical practice, but professional misconduct and also criminal offense. I will uh, discuss few case law on this. Then medical negligence and professional misconduct, we have to understand there is a regulation which has mentioned, doctor should not indulge in deliberately, deliberate medical negligence with the patient. Highest standard of care should be provided. This is part of ethical regulation. And that is why any case or complaint of medical negligence, if brought to the notice of the state medical council, they can also deal with under this regulation and accordingly punishment can be avoided doctor to doctor in addition to consumer court. If it is a criminal negligence case, by the criminal court, and if it is a case before the National Human Rights Commission, before the State Human Rights Commission, they can also take action. So parallel, many action can be taken against the doctor, which usually doctor does not understand or not ready to accept this factual position. Then my, again, uh, a, a question, role of professional association, like, Indian Academy of Forensic Medicine, Indian Congress of Forensic Medicine or Toxicology, and Society for Prevention of Injury and Corporate Punishment, Indian Medical Center. There are n number of association of every specialty. Is there any role of these association in making doctor to understand what is ethics in medical practice? According to Mu, yes, there is a role, but not done as proactive role played by the doctor. So these are the questions based upon my title question. Why there is no deterrence for the ethical practices among the practitioner? I'm not saying every doctor is indulged in unethical practices, but majority, majority, they are even not knowing what is ethical regulation 2002. What is the new draft? You just go through any newspaper, Today's newspaper of Dainik Jagran, which is circulated in my district, having full page advertisement of one of the doctor of BMS, Ayurveda doctor, full page advertisement. So like our council, there is also central council, which also control their regulation similar with the ethical regulation 2002, but we are not aware. That is why we are not taking any action and when there is no action, so where is the question of deterrence? And that is why because why they, this question is raised? My question raised based upon the statistics collected for my research. Number one, is number of consumer cases against doctor increasing at three levels or not? If increasing, why? Is there increase in the number of criminal medical negligence cases throughout India? If yes, why? So where is the ethics? And obviously, many these are uh, I'm uh, asking about or discussing about only those who are reported cases. So, what is the role of individual doctor who just, who comes uh, in whose knowledge this knowledge this practice of unethics comes? What he is doing? Is there any provision? So, I am reminding provision regulation 1.7 of chapter one, which says. Exposure of unethical practices by indulging by your colleague without fear and favor. I found only one case law from Kerala I2 where doctor exercised this right and complained to the medical council. Otherwise, we are not, we are just ignoring or overlooking those unethical practices. Second question, role of professional association. Individual doctor may not able to complain due to fear or busy schedule, but what is the role of professional association? Are we doing, I'm a president of IFM. I can say our member, which are more than 1600 as on today, not playing their role in 
this ethics because this is taught by our subject, our expert, our faculty. Similarly, role of regulatory bodies is NMC or erstwhile Medical Council of India or State Medical Council doing their role in uh, this implementation or enforcement of ethical regulation 2002? Answer is no. Mm -hmm. Even Delhi Medical Council, which is in, located in the uh, state cap uh, cap capital of India, they are not involved in honestly, uh, maybe uh, these things, my words are very painful for many, many of us. But the ground reality is that even ethical regulation 2002 has not been complied by the uh, regulatory authority. UP ka to bahut bura hal hai. Similarly, Bihar, Uttarakhand may be similar situation hai. Punjab mein, Himachal mein, you can know better. So here we have to introspect ourselves if we really want to be ethically practicing doctor. Role of Supreme Court. Whenever these cases reach to the Supreme Court, Supreme Court usually interpreted the law and give uh, a binding case law when there is a gap. Role of High Court. Case may reach to the High Court under Article 226. And again, they are either interpreting and giving verdict, yes, it is ethical or non-ethical or professional misconduct or not. Similarly, there is a role of National Human Rights Commission and State Human Rights Commission. May I just asking uh, you, uh, you should not answer to me, but just ask yourself. Is there anything which is said by National Human Rights Commission on this ethical aspects? Because ethics is nothing but a doctor-patient relationship. And doctor-patient relationship, man, the when, when, when we go by the non-maleficence or beneficence concept. Beneficence means what is best for the patient. We have to do what is the best for the patient. And non-maleficence, at least you cannot do best or benefit, do no harm to the patient. Are we doing that as a doctor, practicing doctor? And here, role of forensic medicine, we have to teach our clinical colleague on this aspect. Recently, in 2018, I'm just, uh, because time is very short for me to cover this broad topic. Rights of the patients. Charter of the patient's rights. This is a uh, almost... Uh, seven or eight page document prepared by the National Human Rights Commission sent to the government of India for approval in 30th September 2018. And recently 2019, there is another act, Clinical Establishment Act 2010, under which there is a three-tier mechanism, National Health Council at the central level, state health council at the state level, and district registering authority at the district level. Usually, CMO or the civil surgeon are the district registering authority for all the clinical establishment. So these are the three bodies which play a very role in these ethical regulation enforcement, along with state medical council and NMC and ethics and registration board. So that document has been discussed, adopted by the National Health Council, sent to all the states through their principal secretary or additional chief secretary for enforcement of those rights of the patient, charter of the patient. Usually Medical Council of India or NMC now and the NAABH, National Accreditation Board of Hospital, they, during inspection, ask for this document at your website. So this is, again, new thing which we have to work on. Role of state government, obviously, without state government, the state medical council cannot work. And role of the central government in because the overall responsibility with the, or especially of medical education, with the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare Government of India. I'm again giving one example on this aspect related to ethics. Recently, there is a circular to the all medical colleges to install CCTV cameras in strategic location and number of location decided 25. 
Similarly, there is a provision of Aadhaar enabled biometric attendance system to be installed in every medical college. My simple question is, is there a right to privacy involved in this circular or implementation of this geo or not? If yes, who is raising their boys? And if not, why we are not raising our boys? And what these professional associations are doing? If you remember, judgment of Supreme Court, constitutional bench, five judge bench, Putu Swami judgment of 2017, clearly mentioned what is right to privacy in reference to medical profession, right of the patient. You are aware that the government of India has started uh, linking your Aadhaar card with the voter card. Is that mandatory or voluntary? According to me, information available to me, it is not mandatory but the voluntary. Then why Aadhaar based attendance system is mandatory? Is it not your personal data? which can be taken by somebody else or which can be sold out. Daily newspaper uh, mentioned about this dot data theft, electronic data theft. So we have to think from this point of view. Uh, this is another area recently when uh, this uh, one of the minister from the West Bengal was arrested. Whenever many minister or high profile person or VIP or bureaucrats arrested, they usually all ill and they admitted to the hospitals. Who is examining them? What is their opinion? Usually by the medical board. So medical board comprising of registered medical practitioner of different specialties in different institutions depending upon that. And are they giving uh, ethical report? And not then what is the reason? Is it due to political pressure? It is due to administrative pressure. If that, is it not unethical? It is not immoral? So we have to think for that, ki what we should do. So few case study, recent case judgment from the Kerala High Court, I will just pass on. Uh, these two regulations specifically has been mentioned. Regulation 1.9, evasion of legal restriction and exposure of unethical acts on the part of professional colleagues. In this particular case, there is violation of Transplantation of Human Organ Act 1994. You remember, there is a provision of brain death certification. You remember, because this has a very uh, much consequences to our profession, forensic expert also, because there is an advisory shoot that night postmortem should be conducted. That means cadaver donation is now in pipeline and many institutions started doing that cadaver donation. So where this transplantation of human organ act come into picture. So in this particular case, this is an article written by me and it is posted on the research gate in I think before one week, hardly one week. Wrong and deliberate brain dead certification, a case of unethical act, oblique professional misconduct, and or criminal prosecution answered by the Kerala High Court. This is the link where this article is available. More than 500 reads within a week. More than 500. It shows importance of this topic. So these are the questions we have to ask from ourselves regarding professional misconduct. Who can take action for these unethical act or professional misconduct? What penalty can be imposed? What is the penalty, actual penalty? Who will award the penalty? When penalty may be imposed? What is the uh, about the compensation issue? Case study of Delhi Medical Council, I have gone through especially because these are the cases available. Case study from Tamil Nadu Medical Council and certain case law of High Court and Supreme Court. Chapter 8 especially deals with the punishment and disciplinary action for unethical act or professional misconduct. So what it said, it must be clearly understood that the instances of offenses and professional misconduct, which are 
above means before chapter 8 chapter 1 to chapter 7 do not constitute and not interfere to constitute a complete list of the infamous act which can be which for which disciplinary action can be taken and that by issuing this notice the medical council of india and or state medical council are no way precluded from considering any dealing with the any other form of professional misconduct on the part of registered medical practitioner what does it mean it means whatever mentioned in chapter 1 to chapter 7 is not exhaustive list these are the cases they are there which in which punishment has already been given or proven cases there are new cases new scenario may arise and they can be taken care by the this regulation by the concerned regulatory body circumstances may and all do arise from time to time because technology advancing new drugs are coming and new new methods of treatments are coming so that is why <coughs> new instances of unethical practices and professional misconduct do arise and they may pose a question of professional misconduct every case should be taken that the code is not violated in letter and spirit here it is important to emphasize what do you mean by letter and spirit in such instances as in all other medical council of india or state medical have to consider and decide upon the facts brought before the medical council or state medical council now ethics and registration board these cases any complaint of this before the appropriate medical council by appropriate because in ut it may be directly to the nmc ethics registration board in a state where a state medical council to the state medical council and upon receiving that professional misconduct they have to hold one inquiry as per the principle of natural justice this is another important term legal term we should remember those who are heading any inquiry either departmental or the it, this uh, state medical council you have to give adequate opportunity to the registered medical practitioner and to the pleader and they may be represented in person or through their pleader uh, many state medical council not allowing pleader so letter and where is the letter and spirit and we are not raising our voice if the medical practitioner is found guilty of committing this professional misconduct that council may award appropriate punishment and this punishment may increase uh, either warning or removal of the register uh, name from the register altogether or for a specified period what we usually teach our students as professional death sentence or temporary erasure of the name that means doctor loses all the privilege of registered medical practitioner so these are the again some question and this first paragraph is important where role of professional bodies is mentioned deletion of register name from the register shall be widely publicized in press as well as in the publication of different associations societies and bodies are we doing this are our general publishing this list of doctor whom to whom this action has been taken if not then are we following that regulation 1.7 or not what is the role of state medical council nmc ethics registration board professional association as per the ethical regulation 2 2002 as on today may be in future draft regulation 2022 how to face inquiry this is for doctor where we have to teach our colleague defend our colleague what they do if they receive a notice from different authority or regarding alleged fake medical certificate what are the remedies available if penalty is imposed by the national medical commission or state medical commission how deterrence can be created among delinquent physician indulged in unethical act or professional misconduct what is the time limit for taking action time limit prescribed under this regulation is 6 month hardly no. any case decided within 6 month dr mukesh yeah please Please sum up the talk in the next two to three minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm summarizing. So this is yeah, the yeah. recent case of Kerala High Court, where court endorsed the action taken by the Tamil Nadu Medical Council. Another case where uh, dying declaration short of certificate 
before making a valid will for property has been taken by these doctor and ultimately action has been taken by the tamil nadu medical council other consequences in this particular case the fir laws investigation charge trial multiple litigation loss of reputation of medical profession pendency in court unnecessary financial loss trauma to the patient and the family also this is another case from delhi medical council i am just passing on this case where emergency medical officer issued a wrong death certificate and ultimately action has been taken by the delhi medical council last question is there any role of eticom module and ethical medical practice eticom module stand for attitude ethics and communication thank you thank you very much these are my references any question i am glad to answer mike now the this is over to you an informative discourse your mementos are still with us whenever you visit chamba we would love to have you among us thank you thank you very much thank you very much So the next topic for the session is A to Z of Matching Healthcare Act 2017. So I request Dr. S K Singhal, Dr. Vinod, and Dr. Jagender Singh kindly be seated because you are the chairperson for the next session. Okay. Now I would like to invite uh, our guest speaker, Dr. Priya Ranjit Avinash, Associate Professor, Department of Psychiatry, Kings Bihar. Welcome, sir. Before we start uh, the next session, I would like to request Mr. Bodhiya sir and Mr. Bodhiya sir to please take the few doctors that they are coming uh, from Punjab. Please, sir. Now, first of all, I would, I would like to name uh, Dr. Sandeep sir. He is an orthopedician from Jhanda. <laughs>
Good morning to all of you. I'm Dr. Priyaranjana Vinash, and I get this. I may appear as an odd man out among all the stalwarts of forensic medicine all over India. Uh, the topic, the topic that I have been given is to give an overview of a Mental Health Care Act. Mental Health Care Act uh, came in 2017. And it has uh, changed the way how mental health care is done in India almost overnight. So when I was reading this act, I felt that if I am, as a psychiatrist, finding this act to read so boring, what about the other people who would be reading this act? It would be a human just task to read 60 pages of law. So what I've tried to do is to simplify this act for the benefit of our audience using all the alphabets of English language from starting from A to Z. So each alphabet will denote something very important about this mental health care act. Uh, why are we talking about it? Because there is no running away from this act. Everywhere where we, patients with mental illness are admitted, we need to follow this act. This act came in being in 2017, but the rules and the regulation came only in 2018 May. Uh, what is this act? The definition is that this is an act to give care and to protect, promote, and fulfill the rights of persons with mental illness. Let's skip that part. Uh, why are we having a new act when we had an act before? Because as you know that United Nations Conventions of Right of Persons with Disability, we are the signatory of it. So we have to modify our act based on Persons of Disability Act in 2016 as well. Now, none of the hospitals, it is not an act only for the mental asylums of the mental hospitals. This act is for all the hospitals, even for Chamba Medical College. If they are admitting a patient of mental illness in their ward, they have to follow this. Act. So we, there is no running away from this act. Now start the journey of alphabet A to Z. Uh, A stands for advanced directive. Now this act is very interesting. It gives the right of deciding what kind of treatment a patient of mental illness would want on the patient himself. So when the person of mental illness is not very unwell, so he has recovered from his illness, he can make an advanced directive just like a will, that when later he will fall ill again, because most of the mental illness are chronic, as you know. So when later when he will fall ill again, he will decide that what kind of treatment he would want then. Even now he can decide that. So it's like a will, what kind of treatment he would want, what kind of treatment he would not want. B stands for banned. So there are a lot of things that was practiced in mental health care before. It is, this act says that it is not allowed anymore. It's banned. Like chaining, you must have read in the newspaper or seen in the television that some mental hospitals used to chain their patients. And then there was a fire in Yerwadi, where one of the mental health hospitals. Uh, many patients could not run away from, the, from their bed because they were chained to their bed. Or some of them were chained to trees or windows. And they could not run away and they died. So this practice of chaining the patient or putting patients in seclusion, like you put them as if like they're in a jail, that is also banned. Unmodified ECT. So electroconvulsive therapy is a accepted method of treatment for mental illness, severe mental illness. But in many hospitals, especially the smaller hospitals, they were not using the more scientific and more advanced method of treatment of ECT that is called modified, where we give anesthesia. We, we actually make the patient unconscious so that the treatment does not become very brutal. So that is now banned. So without giving anesthesia, you can't give ECT. So unmodified ECT is banned. ECT during emergency. So emergency is the first 72 hours of treatment. That is also banned. And ECT to minor. So there was a lot of debate whether a minor, somebody who is less than 18, if he has a severe mental illness, can he be given ECT? This act said, yes, he can be given, but only in the rarest of circumstances when two psychiatrists independently certify that he would require it. And I'll talk about when I'll come to the alphabet M. So there is an entity called Mental Health Review Board that will also have to certify. Now this act is talking about the patient will themselves decide what kind of treatment. 
but you must be wondering person of mental illness how can you decide because you must be having a perception that people with mental illness would not have a good judgment now this act says that see every person who knows at least these three things knows what what kind of treatment what kind of illness he has knows why why he would require treatment or why he would not require treatment and knows the alternatives that if he is not choosing this treatment then what are the alternatives that he had if he knows this these three cardinal answers even if he is mentally ill he would be considered to have a capacity to make his decision so a, a bad judgment an imprudent judgment imprudent decision does not mean incapacity so to a treating psychiatrist his judgment may appear a bad judgment but it doesn't mean that he does not have the right to make a judgment so this act keeps saying that every mental illness person may be having capacity unless proven otherwise d is for definition now what does exactly mental illness is this act says that that any substantial disorder of thought perception mood judgment cognition means your ability to think and comprehend which is grossly impaired even if it is due to a substance use now that was a catch so if an alcohol use disorder patient with having mental illness because of alcohol use will also be considered a person with mental illness and will be having all the rights that a person with mental illness has but mental retardation is not considered as a mental illness according to this act because they have better act called persons with disability act for mental retardation now e is for emergency so first 72 hours of treatment of a person with mental illness is considered emergency and even a general practitioner for want of a specialist can also provide mental health care for first 72 hours now f stands for family so any person who is related to the person with mental illness either through blood adoption or marriage is family but in india typically family only takes the responsibility of treatment of a person with mental illness but this act says that there can be a caregiver also who can decide for the treatment of the person with mental illness g stands for good faith now this act says that any decision taken by the authorities like there will be a lot of authorities i will be talking about it if it is done in the in the good faith of the patient or the person with mental illness if there are any negative consequences of it he or she would not be held responsible for it because the person has taken that decision in good faith h stands for health establishment mental health establishment now all the psychiatry wards will be called now as a mental health establishment even a ayush hospital which is admitting a person with mental mental illness would also be considered as a mental health establishment and that establishment need to fulfill all the criteria that is given in this act including the addiction center now himachal pradesh i am have been told has a big drug use problem like there are a lot of addiction addiction centers you must be a wonder you must be aware of it punjab has a big problem where i come from uttarakhand has a big problem of drug use and there are a lot of de addiction centers most of these de addiction centers are being run by ex addicts none of the mental health professionals are there for care now with this new act is these de addiction centers will also have to fulfill all the uh, the like the facilities that that this act says and all the criteria has to be fulfilled by them but only if they are admitting the patient so only indoor care is considered as mental establishment if you are just seeing a patient an out patient it will not be covered as a uh, uh, mental health establishment now i stands for insurance uh, i'm sure all of you must be aware many of you must be having medical insurance if you have read read the fine print of the medical insurance you will find that it doesn't cover mental illness now you must be wondering if you are mental illness is also like any other medical illness why it doesn't cover uh, mental illness so that this act also found and took a cognizance of it and it has given a directive to insurance regulatory development authority of india which decides all this to include all mental illness including suicide suicide attempt which is also a part of a mental illness to in, in the mental illness uh, in the insurance purview interestingly the biggest insurance scheme that government of india has ayushman bharat yojana almost all of all over india we have that that does not cover mental illness it's, and that's like a contradictory to to the government policy itself so i wonder why it is not but probably in some time it will cover mental illness also i also stands for independent admission means let's say a person with mental illness 
have depression or anxiety or some illness which is not very severe and he feels that he requires indoor care then he can volunteer himself for treatment and admission such kind of admission as called as independent admission means the person himself decides for his admission so the admission is independent the discharge is also independent so whenever he wants now that he is fine he can take discharge also a psychiatrist or the treating doctor cannot refuse discharge because it was an independent admission k stands for jail now there are many mentally ill person languishing in the jails of all over india all the state jails will have with people with mental illness now this act says that uh, and and the vice versa is also there like there are many mental hospitals the big ones the old ones like agra one the rachi one i have studied in a mental hospital for my md so we had a separate jail ward in the hospital where all these uh, convicts or uh, they are under trial prisoners with mental illness are staying this act says that rather than having a jail like a situation in a mental hospital there has to be a revert so in a jail every jail every state jail the big ones which has got more than 500 inmates there should be at, a, at least a 20 bedded mental hospital in the jail so j stands for jail k stands for so i have done some hacks also because i wanted to fulfill all the alphabet so k stands for lock so patient cannot be person with mental illness cannot be locked as i have already said l stands for least restrictive facility now many patients with mental illness are staying in a mental hospital even though they have recovered for want that the family is not willing to take them back what about those patients this act says that it's upon the government state government to have lesser restrictive facilities like halfway homes or uh, there are uh, day care centers or sheltered accommodations where these patients can be brought and kept they cannot stay in the hospital which is a more restrictive environment because you cannot come out of the hospital on your own for forever because the family is not willing to take them so every patient has a right to stay in a lesser restrictive facility than in what he or she is now m stands for mental health review board each district of every state himachal pradesh is also not an exception i don't know the status of what is currently happening in himachal but i just did some uh, uh, online search and i found that uh, they have also started having this mental health review boards in each district now what is the role of this review board every time a person with mental illness is admitted without his or her consent because the person is very ill mental health review board has to be informed about it every time a minor is admitted in a mental health establishment mental health review board has to be informed about it and this review board is headed by an by a judge or a uh, current judge or an ex uh, judicial magistrate chief judicial magistrate and upward judge there are uh, representation of doctors also representation of ngos also representation of people with mental illness also so it's an it's a holistic body which will decide whether the admission and the treatment is fair or not so it's like a watchdog it will also look into the advance directive i have already mentioned it will look into nominative dependency which i will talk about it and m also stands for minor it said that in any hospital if minor are being admitted in a psychiatry ward it has to be a separate in place it can't be next to the adult patient so there has to be a separate provision for minor admission n stands for nominated dependency it's a very interesting thing of the about this act this act says that a person with mental illness can decide that hence onward whenever i fall sick again my decisions will be taken by him or her now that person could be anybody it could be part of the family it could be beyond the family and that will be considered as a nominated dependency so when the person is severely ill next time uh, the nominated dependency will take any decision on behalf of the person with mental illness and this nr nominated dependency has to be recorded so there are bodies like mental review board i have already mentioned there are bodies like state mental authority which will keep an account of every person with mental illness and their nominated dependency o stands for informed con consent uh, there is a lot of discussion about informed consent and we have uh, taken for granted the consent from the person with mental illness now this act says that the same principle of informed consent will be consent will be taken as an a person without mental illness when it comes to uh, any decisions regarding the person now this act says that 
P stands for person with mental illness. Why I'm again and again saying this long word person with mental illness? I'm not just saying mentally ill. I'm not saying psychiatric patient, etc., etc. So it was considered that this was a very stigmatizing word that he is mental. So rather than using a very stigmatizing nomenclature, mentally ill, this act says that that person will be called as a person with mental illness. He is not mentally ill forever. He has mental illness. He may not have mental illness later. So to reduce stigma, Q stands for there are a lot of questions. Now all of you are forensic experts. There is a term called unsound mind. And now this act says that mere presence of mental illness does not mean unsound of mind. So he may, for example, the section IPC 84 says that if the person is an unsound mind, does an any act of crime, he would not be punished for the same because he may, may not have realized that he have done this crime. But that is unsound mind. Not every person with mental illness is unsound mind. R stands for registration. So every mental health establishment, that means every psychiatry hospital, need to be registered under the state mental health authority. So each state will have one authority and that registration is provisional to begin with and it will become permanent once that establishment fulfills the minimum standard that has been formed by the state authority and if it fulfills, then only it will be registered for permanent registration. S stands for state mental authority. I keep talking about state mental authority. What is it? See, there is a, in each state, there will be one authority, that state mental authority, which will cover all the hospitals under, all the mental establishment under the, that state, be it government, be it private, be it NGO, anything. And its primary task is to regulate, register, and to supervise and make rules for all these mental establishments. Uh, Uttarakhand, where I come from, we have recently started having our state mental authority. I am a member of that. Uh, CMHA, that is the central mental authority. So all the AIMS and other tertiary care institutes coming from directly from central government will be registered under CMHA. Uh, many non-medical members are also there in SMHA, like representation from NGO. There is even a representation from caregivers of person with mental illness and including patients with mental illness. So they will also be represented. So there's a 12 member authority includes six members from patients, NGO and the caregiver of the patient. So they get a very, they get an equal right, like right to vote is one. Uh, S also stands for supported admission. So if the person does not have the capacity, I kept talking about capacity. So at that time of admission, if the person does not have capacity, then that person will be admitted under supported admission. And that supported admission cannot be forever. It can only get increased by 30 days after each time the hospital where the patient is admitted gives an, in writing to the mental review board to kindly extend the admission by 30 more days. C stands for the rights. There are a lot of rights of person with mental illness. One of the rights is that a person with mental illness has a right to access his medical record. If he wants a medical record within three days of writing, the hospital need to provide the OPD and IPD medical record of the person with mental illness. You cannot force them to wear hospital clothes. He has a right to dignity. He has a right to privacy. If he can have conversation with his family, so he has the right to communicate. And most important, he has a right to include most psychiatric drugs under the essential drug list of that state. So if the state makes an essential drug list, it has to include majority of the psychiatric medicine and that's the right of person with mental illness. U stands for unless proven otherwise. Now, what is it? Uh, again, this topic probably will be interesting for you because suicide has been, suicide attempt has been always considered as if it's a crime against humanity. It's a crime against right to life. And that's why somebody who attempted suicide, there was a section IPC 309 said that that person is liable for conviction. Now imagine the dogma and the pain of a person with mental illness who has attempted suicide out of no way. He doesn't find any, any brightness. There is no light at the end of the tunnel. And after he survives, he is convicted. So this, meant, this act says that section 309 stands repealed according to this act because this act categorically says that any person with who has attempted suicide would be considered to be undergoing a lot of mental stress and mental illness unless proven otherwise. There might be some other reason also. And this act has an overriding 
power over the IPC in the according to the section 120 of this act. Uttarakhand, again, I'm talking about Uttarakhand because I'm coming from Uttarakhand and other hilly states, including Himachal, where we all are sitting right now. We get an extra time for many of the things, provisions of the act. So the act was a little lenient about the hill states because it knew the geography and topography of hill states may not be so fast to catch up with the act. V stands for verdict. So there was a lot of discussion about a lot of things in this act and the final verdict came. One of the most important thing was who is a clinical psychologist? So you must be seeing that there are psychologists, counselors, every left, right and center. Are they all really clinical psychologists? Now this act categorically said that clinical psychologist is one who has done a master's in psychology followed by a two years MPhil course in clinical psychology and that course has to be recognized by Rehabilitation Council of India just like how we have NMC and MCI they have a Rehabilitation Council of India. V also is verdict for restriction to discharge functions by professionals not covered by professionals. In simple language this act says that a neurologist, a neurosurgeon, a cardiologist, a dermatologist who often treat patients with mental illness uh, going beyond their professional judgment and professional skill are not allowed to do that according to this act. W stands for WHO. Why WHO? Because this all started from the WHO UNCRPD signation, signature that we did and that's why we have this new act, India being a signatory. X stands for XVI. That means there are total 16 chapters in this, in this act and 126 sections. Y stands for various including yoga, Ayurveda, Yunani. I said that this act recognizes Ayush also as an important uh, stakeholder when it comes to treatment of person with mental illness and it covers Ayush also. Z stands for the Zenith. I believe that with this new act, mental health care all over India will reach up to its maximum height, that is Zenith. Uh, just to summarize, where are we now? Like all this theory, all this lecture, where exactly we are at this moment, the ground reality. The ground reality is that after the act, a lot of new, a lot of the rules, regulations, guidelines, etc., had to come. But majority of states are lagging behind it because the act is a very broad thing. The minor intricacies of the day-to-day -day functioning of a mental hospital requires specific rules, regulations, and policies. Now, what about that? So this act says that after this new act comes, there will be state mental authority rules. So Uttarakhand has one, Himachal also has one. Mental Health Review Board has to be established in all the districts. Uh, I, I assume that in Himachal, all the districts have not been covered yet. Then there are also rights of person with mental illness rules. So there are rules for the right of persons and there are minimum standards. I will emphasize about the minimum standard that if this new act comes into its being letter and principle, 99% of the DHS center that you see in your state be it Himachal, Uttarakhand or any part of India are going to close down because all of them are doing absolute medical malpractice. So the hard reality is that many states have not formed their SMHA yet. Uh, many states have not drafted their state mental authority rules and regulations also. Forget permanent provisional registration is also not done in most of the states. And most mental establishments are still not fulfilling the standards that has been, even if it has been given. And there are, when I was working under the state mental authority, I found there a lot of conflict. Like somebody said that, okay, it comes under our department, like uh, the rights of uh, the, the Department of Social Welfare and Ministry of Social Welfare and Justice. It says that all the disability comes under us. So many of the disability is due to mental illness. What about that? So due to this departmental conflict, majority of the things are at a deadlock. And there are a lot of pressure groups. I have felt pressure groups from the DHL centers because most of the DHL centers are run by highly powerful people because it's a money minting business. So they do not want this act to come into a being. So this is just a picture of my hospital. I thought I saw your beautiful medical college. Wanted to show my college as well. Thank you. Yes. Yes, but what we believe and what we believe does not have any role in the act. The act says, I'll tell you, the act says categorically that all the Ayush, Ayurveda, Yunani, Yoga, Siddha, Homeopathy, five, all of them have master's degree in mental health, mental health just like how we have MD psychiatry. There are MD in Ayurveda Charya of 
मानसिक रोग लाइक दिस ओनली द स्पेशलिस्ट नॉट टू बट नॉट द बी एन नॉट टू right right you can because i i told you that there is a provision of emergency treatment so it's an emergency your patient landed up with post operative some delirium some confusion some disorientation and you need to immediately help the patient most likely you are going to treat them for few days only so you can do that i just mentioned that so the qualification for a clinical psychologist is a masters degree ma or msc in psychology followed by two years degree of mphil mphil is a degree that is you must be aware of it mphil in clinical psychology now the now the centers and the colleges which gives these degrees are very limited you can literally count on your fingers yes so that it is written it is written in this act this act is is clearly written here that's why i said that there was a verdict there was a lot of confusion about it so there are two two things one is clinical psychology one is associate psychology right sir psychology sir but i right now it will it cannot happen according to this act the signatory power of a plain masters in psychology has no power at all because that person will not be considered as a clinical psychologist he will be just a psychologist not a clinical psychologist there are there are uh, i'll tell you sir there are there are almost 10 to 12 government colleges and now after this act many private colleges have started this so there are good number of private colleges government colleges are like cip rachi that rachi is and you must be aware nimhans bangalore aims has it in delhi we have uh, in uh, ibas that institute of human behavior and allied sciences uh, that sahadra mental hospital that is how it is called uh, rml also has it so there are good number of colleges i come from assam where i studied not come from assam but i studied my masters in assam and we had a uh, clinical psychology course also because it's a regional college so like that every state now has maybe one or two at the most Uh, sir sir i i did not get the last point of the clinical psychologist or psychiatrist so somebody who has a degree in in psychiatry okay okay no no they cannot be they cannot be sir so there is a post there is a pro, like in this act i did not mention about it there is something called psychiatric nurse also the psychiatric nurse is after their bsc or their diploma in psych uh, in their uh, whatever degree that they have nursing have followed by that they have a dpn course uh, diploma in psychiatric nursing or there is a three uh, masters course that is masters msc in, in psychiatric nursing so they will be called as psychiatric nurse but never as a clinical psychologist right now this is a very debatable thing sir actually anybody who has a when i because i am a psychiatrist i work with psychologists all the time and i do have conflicts with them so these kind of debates we had and they had their take on that was if you go to the oxford dictionary of doctor word what is doctor basically so anybody who is an expert expert of something sir with a phd you get a doctor degree you get a doctorate you can prefix doctor after phd even if you have done a phd in anything but you are not a medical doctor so to prefix doctor you can have 
you can prefix it because our mci or nmc does not say that who can use the prefix of doctor and who who cannot so they somehow get around the law but they are not medical doctors but for patients patient get confused whether that person is a medical doctor or not absolutely absolutely right right absolutely right right no but now what they have they have an allied meant uh health professional uh, the new act has come where physiotherapists speech therapists and occupational therapists all this and they have been given that they can use doctor but with another bracket pt for pt for physiotherapists ot for occupational therapists like that thank you Thank you so much, sir, for enlightening us. Now, I would request our peer person to please come and felicitate Doctor Bhir and Dr. Abhinash. Now I would request Dr. Manish Sahagun, Associate Professor, Department of Orthopedics, Government Medical College, Jhumma, to felicitate Dr. Joginder Singh, Dr. S K Singhal, and Dr. Vinod. Thank you. 
I would like to invite uh, the students uh, from the Gupta Chamber. Can they come up here? I think two students are there. They are going to present the oral presentation. Childhood should be carefree, playing in the sun, not living a nightmare in the darkness of the soul. With these lines of Dave Benzer, I extend my warm greetings to Honorable President of the Institution, Chief Guest, Professors, Doctors, Fellow Speakers, and Listeners. I feel grateful to, to the Medical College Jambar for providing me this, this opportunity to throw some light on the dark theme of child abuse. This is Muskan representing Jawahar Navadi Vitalia Jambar. Child abuse. Despite being one among the emerging terms in our 21st century, we often neglect it and leave it to the parents as holding their children for the sake of parenthood. But now it's high time that we, as a citizen of 21st century, take child abuse to its real meaning, understand it deeply, and spread awareness about the same. But before extending our issue, let's first of all understand what child abuse really means. Child abuse means hurting a child physically, mentally, emotionally, or psychologically. Child abuse may include any act that results in actual or potential harm to a child and can occur in child's home, schools, organizations, and the communities the child interacts with. Undoubtedly, child abuse hurts the sentiment of a child. Different children experience this harassment in different ways. For a female child, it can be female in, for a female child, it can be female, female infanticide, early marriage in child rearing, prostitution, harassment, rapes, and molestation. While, while for a male child, it can be minor things like putting the social stigma of boys don't cry and encouraging them towards being what is called a real man. While for a child from the LGBTIQ acres community, it gets even worse as they are made fun of their behavior, which opposes their appearances. Even for me as an individual, child abuse is when I am made feel uncomfortable, either physically or emotionally. Friends, these may sound like a normal go-to actions, but whatever I say, I really mean it. The subjugating concept of child abuse or child maltreatment, as it is well said, can compel our generation to give a thought to suicide, and from the increasing cases through media, the reality cannot be true. The human rights of child abuse in India and elsewhere in the world, even when practiced on paper, are violated in practice. But now it's time that we end the stigma. It's time we start talking about innocent children being abused, either physically, mentally, emotionally, or even by toxic parenting. A crowd of counselors in the school is a good medium of overcoming the self-doubt in children. And gatherings like these is perhaps the best way to make people aware about the stigma. Moreover, children can approach the child helpline number that is 1098 issued by the government. At the end, I would say that I'm a human being and I'm a girl. I could either be a boy or a drum, but all I want is love, someone to understand. I know I have wings and I can try. If I can try, I can fly too. Thank you everyone for your patient hearing. Thank you so much. Next
So, first of all, I will like to say that all the children they have done wonderful. But uh, as it is the our duty as uh, judges to give them first, second, third, uh, almost all of them are best. And uh, so, please, children, if if it is first, second, third, that doesn't matter. It is your participation. It is your commitment towards the child abuse and the rights for the child. And all of you have done wonderful. Congratulations from my side to all of you. But I for my duty. So we are going to uh, give the award as by the organizers that there is a first prize, second prize, third prize, and one appreciation award. So the appreciation award goes to Bhageshiri.
Three days of academic and palatial feast given by the organizing committee of 19th conference of ICFMT and 6th conference of SPIC gave a beautiful experience to we all who assembled here. The academic activities planned included discussions and talks on medical negligence, then Supreme Court guidelines in reference to medical negligence, surrogacy, assault on doctor, abuse of child, women and elderly, crime scene, COVID-19, consent, mass disasters, mental health act, DNA. What a beautiful three plays we enjoyed on to child labor, ragging, and today there will be one on child abuse. Dr. Pradeep, through his personal contact and commitment and galaxy of people here, Dr. Gargi, Dr. Murthy, Dr. S.K. Verma, Dr. Adarsh Kumar, Dalbir Singh, Dr. Goria, Dr. Bhaisora, Dr. A.K. Srivastav, Ashok Chanana, Kanagwal, Mukesh Yadav, Harish Dasari, Akhilesh Pathak, Pragnesh Parmar, Yaswinder, Sarabjit, Amandeep, Anil Garg, Puneet Kurana, Kuldeep Kumar, Nagmohan, and Rajiv Joshi, Dr. Samarika, and Dr. Priya Ranjan. And the important thing we witnessed was fellowship award to Dr. Pradeep and the Young Scientist Award being presented to Parul Khare. Behind the success of the conference, I noticed three P's. Pankaj, Puja, and the best and the great. Among the, these three P's, Pradeep. And I also would appreciate the brain behind the success of Dr. Pandeep, young, smart, charming, Dolly. The most appreciative part of this conference, which is rare to find these days, Rather, you find we teachers discussing that the students have changed. I found these students, or technically known as volunteers, being present here before even the organizing secretary, giving us beautiful randolis, which carried messages, being here, active, Onto the scientific sessions, 
or during meals. So sweet of you, dear volunteer. Dr. Pradeep also had the backing, very strong one, of the non-teaching staff who were with him practically like a shadow. He wants them, it was something like a surgeon's prerogative. Before he called, one is already present. Beautiful. Sir, this specialty of forensic medicine, though since many years, is still in its infancy. What an issue that in 93, the faculty from surgery, medicine, pathology, and anatomy could be the teachers in forensic medicine. Now, if we really want the progress of this specialty, we have to be very careful about the teaching we undertake for the UG and PG. If a student of mine is satisfied, he becomes my ambassador, communicating to others that forensic was interesting and single taught us well. That is what will bring laurels to our specialty. The people who matter must ensure that every medical college, be it government, private, or a deemed university, must conduct postmortems. Since without proper postmortems in the college, neither forensic can progress nor clinical care can progress. At the same time, it should be made binding that every department of forensic medicine would have a special section on clinical forensic medicine. It is desirable to have a toxicology lab so that we can help the cases of poisoning in reference to diagnosis by diagnosing the poison the patient has consumed. Many challenging situations arise for the forensic experts. Whenever there's a question of a decomposed body, maybe death has occurred a few or a few weeks earlier. Whenever we are dealing with mutilated bodies, whenever police brings small pieces of bones, the poison consumed is an obscure poison. Delays in reporting by the forensic science laboratory. Bare minimum teaching staff available in forensic medicine, considering the work being done. Obscure autopsy, negative autopsy, and whenever it, this is death due to endocrinal disorders or bacterial or viral infections. But it is said, dead do tell tales. Therefore, a careful autopsy undertaken and the aid taken of the various investigative agencies, histopathology, chemical analysis, and microbiology can help us arrive at the conclusions in majority of the cases. Collect the evidence properly, preserve it carefully, and this notion that has come that the investigative part is the role of the forensic science laboratory. My experience says no law prohibits us from doing those investigations, like very important. In a case of alleged actual sexual assault, if I go for preparation of slide and report absence or presence of spermatozoa 
and leave it to the court whether to accept that evidence or not. I feel and I have experienced that is important and useful in case FSL after 3, 6, 12, 18, 20 months reports, absence of spermatozoa. So from our side, we should undertake research. We should give good topics to our PG students so that we witness progress in the specialty. Thank you and best of luck. Punjabi Vega and more of the person to address all of us on a closing ceremony of the conference. And I request our guest of honor, Dr. Obi Murthy, Professor in New Delhi, to address the gathering. Mande Principal Sahab, Organizing Secretary Pradeep Singh, President. S.K. Verma ji and Chief Guest S.K. Singhal Sahib. This is a very important thing and the people of Chamba have given us love and love will be remembered. If there is a place where you have remembered, then you have given honor, hospitality, and the way you have done the organization. In these circumstances, because this conference was in 2020, लेकिन कोविड की वजह से ये हो नहीं पाई थी तो हम लोगों ने भी अपनी पूरी कोशिश करी कि हम यहाँ किसी न किसी तरह से पहुँचे और हमने अपने अपने रोल अदा किए पर हम आप लोगों के शुक्रगुजार रहेंगे और आगे भविष्य में कामना करते होंगे कि आपने जरूर कोई मैसेज लिया होगा इस कॉन्फ्रेंस से और भी कॉन्फ्रेंस ऑर्गेनाइज करते रहिए कि जब तक ये समारोह होते रहेंगे एक दूसरे का विचार आदान प्रदान और एक दूसरे से मोहब्बत बढ़ती रहेगी हमें मोहब्बत बढ़ाना है उसी का पैगाम सब समाज को देना है थैंक यू वेरी मच हाँ जी थैंक यू सर वी आर इंडीड डिलाइटेड टू हैव यू विद अस May I now take the stage of this meeting, Dr. S. K. Verma, President of the Congress of Forensic Medicine and Toxicology, to address the audience. Respected uh, people on the dais, Chief Guest, Dr. Singhal Saab, Principal of the College. Dr. Pankaj Gupta ji, my dear friend, Dr. Murthy, Dr. Goria, Dr. Bhasora, and my dear organizing secretary, Dr. Pradeep. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers who have given this opportunity to all the delegates to visit this holy city of Chamba, the city of Lord Shiva. And I can vouch upon the feedback received by the delegates that the three days they have spent over here, that will be remembered in their memory for a long time. This is the occasion which was full of academic activity, starting from the CME first day up to the last session. Along with that, not only we have the academic fields, but it was full of the participation from the very loved students of this college. I wish we should give a big round of applause to all the volunteers and the students. You see, today itself, 
when myself, Dr. Pradeep and Dr. Goria came around 8.30 in the morning, I saw some of the students making the rangoli in front of this gate. So that is the, speaks volumes about the dedication of the students. Now this moment is something very touchy. Three days, we were all full of enthusiasm. We were meeting in a large family. बहुत बड़ा परिवार हमारा हुआ करीब डेढ़ सौ दो सौ लोग इकट्ठे हुए और अब ये समय है जब हम सब लोग अपने अपने गृह निवास पर जाने की तैयारी कर रहे हैं तो मन कुछ थोड़ा सा भारी भी लग रहा है लेकिन इस उम्मीद के साथ कि बिछड़ना जरूरी है फिर मिलने के लिए अगर हम बिछड़ेंगे नहीं तो दोबारा मिलेंगे कैसे इन्हीं शब्दों के साथ मैं आप सब का बहुत आभारी हूं तहे दिल से कि आप सब ने इतना प्यार इतना अफेक्शन और सबसे ज्यादा डॉक्टर प्रदीप सिंह उनकी टीम और उनकी फैमिली मैडम भी बैठी हुई हैं उनके लिए भी बहुत बहुत शुभकामनाएं कि उन्होंने इतनी मेहनत के साथ ये कॉन्फ्रेंस ऑर्गेनाइज की और हम इनवाइट करता हूं मैं आप सब लोगों को नेक्स्ट ईयर इसी समय में लगभग दिल्ली में हम फिर मिलेंगे लॉन्ग लिव आईसीएफ एम टी एंड लॉन्ग लिव स्पिक थैंक यू I think get started with that. That's the most thing. Get the father, but the principal, that's the content of the president, ICFM lead, Dr. Verma, and secretary, Dr. Baitora, and my dear Dr. Pandey. So, the things have been made easy for me because everything has been said by my predecessors. What should I say more? But I will like to say that what has been done by the team, that is par excellence. Whether it is the receiving the delegates, whether it is putting them comfortably in the hotels and guest houses, whether they bringing them to the venue of the conference, whether it is the food or it is the academics in everything in everything there is par excellence and if you want to say that is there any fault the only thing is what i will say yes there is one fault and what is that that there was no fault at all and for this i will like to congratulate the organizing team ably led by the principal sir who gave a free hand to dr pradeep singh and pradeep singh utilized that free hand and probably when we will go dr pankaj gupta will be proud of dr pradeep singh for giving him free hand. so i say for dr pradeep singh this is a uh, good personal achievement that he organized this conference he got a fellowship from the conference of the speak and he got elected the general secretary of the uh, society for prevention of injuries and corporal punishment so he had a hat trick so congratulations to dr pradeep singh for that but it is not only dr pradeep singh he is leading everybody it is a teamwork and all the faculty members all his friends all his colleagues all the persons from the college and the department especially from the department of forensic medicine his colleagues all have done wonderfully well and they have been so well supported by the students 
that I wish to say hippy for the students. Hippy? 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 And with this, I would like to say that we invite you to our next conference at Chandigarh, Government Medical College Chandigarh, and uh, which is will be dates will be announced soon by the organizers, and uh, we will meet there. And uh, especially, I will like to say thanks to the volunteers that they have worked so tirelessly that every at every step it was just like a robot. The everything was at the right place at the right time and at the right venue. So this is great. And uh, I appreciate uh, the work done by all of you, by, by the learned speakers, by the chairperson, and by everybody. So my sincere thanks and my good wishes for Pardeep and his family, uh, Dolly and his uh, lovely children, that uh, they are giving him courage, they are giving him moral support, they are sparing him from the family business that he can spare time to be for that conference. So, and I think the students of this institute are lucky to have Dr. Pradeep Singh here. Because he's showing you a leadership which knowingly and un, uh, unknowingly you are acquiring so many qualities that how to arrange something and this will go a long way in your life when uh, you become doctors and you have to lead at many places and one of the qualities of the doctor is to lead and that is expected from them and to be a member of the team so he has shown that how this can be done so all of you are very lucky and i congratulate and give my good wishes to all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir, for inviting us. And so we, we, we would love to agree with you that we are indeed grateful to have Dr. Vibhiv as a guide. So thank you so much, sir. We are truly grateful to have you here with us. I now I'm going to talk the Dr. Assembly, Dr. Kiki Batora, to address the uh, gathering. We now request the Honorable Principal, Dr. Pankaj Gupta, to conclude the three-day conference with these kind words. Our respected Chief Guest, today Dr. S.K. Singhal, who is additional principal Ananta Medical College, Udaipur, Rajasthan. Uh, our guest of honor today, Dr. O.P. Murthy, Dr. R.K. Goria, President Spec, Dr. C.P. Basora, General Secretary, ICFMT, and Dr. Pradeep Power, Organizing Secretary. Good afternoon to all. Three days of pure academics. What more you want? So, and, and this purpose, the purpose of conference was well served because we had pure academics for three days. Six months back, when Dr. Pradeep and I was discussing, he told that we'll be organizing, uh, he'll be organizing, not we, he'll be organizing a conference of such a magnitude. I was skeptical. I believe his organizing skill because he has great organizing skill. There is no doubt about it. But still, I was skeptical because look, where are the where are the funds? Where are the resources? We are in a hilly terrain, and there are meager resources. But I think I am standing in front of you after three days, and I I, have, I believe and I am very sure that the purpose of this conference was well served, and he has done a great job in organizing such a wonderful conference. Dr. Singhal told us about three people. I was, I thought, who is the third one? And then retrospectively, I, then, then he announced that she is uh, Dr. Pooja. I thought she is the most important P in us. And behind the scenes, there is no doubt about it. 
there were few suggestions about some shortcomings yesterday and if there are really some shortcomings i personally take the responsibility it was our maiden trial we are our college is in fancy and this is the first time we are organizing uh, this type, this uh, this organize uh, this uh, conference of such a magnitude i take the responsibility and and i am sure next time we will do it much much bigger much much bigger with with the help from all the dignitaries from the help of uh, our faculty and all i like to thank all my faculty most importantly our students who has worked so hard there are exams are near but they still are working so hard and they are working day and night i really thank you you our sporting staff and uh, in the end most importantly madam dolly i think i think you spared so much you spared dr uh, pradeep for uh, for such a long time uh, there was exams of uh, your uh, children but still uh, you spared him and i thank you from core of my heart uh, in the end i'll say we will we'll be trying to organize such a, such big conferences uh, time and again so that our college becomes a hub of academics thank you thank you so much sir there is a notion believe that the word is a thing well done is having done it however we would be falling short of our duty if we not have it well done and encourage it when i request dr pradeep singh our organizing secretary to propose the vote of thanks good afternoon everyone before starting uh, my vote of thanks i would like to give the trophies uh, to the students uh, of the pg if they are available they can you can will come up here and receive your trophies so dr rk goria sir kon hai aaj aao na first hai na koi first ha uh, yes you come up thank you anyone who is here second third and appreciation no one is here the kali would give sir has started a new topic that is single sir ppp public private part and eh, partnership <laughs> so before uh, my sir and dr pankaj remain uh, in touch with uh, each other most of the time and jo kya bolte hain lunch hota hai hum to take karte hain we don't forget it and dr pooja is the also a behind the scene uh, for the success of this conference and it is my duty that she should be appreciated and felicitated also now dr pooja please come up this is a important part of the whatever we will see there is a inauguration on the first day second day and uh, this validity function all it has has to be taken care by the dr pooja from the hostel freely we have got a academic extravaganza that we have you all have enjoyed our hospitality so we have got a lectures from 
फोरेंसिक मेडिसिन फर्टर्निटी सकेट्रिस्ट फ्रॉम देहरादून एंड डेंटल फर्टर्निटी वन वन फ्रॉम टुडे वी हैव सीन हर शी वाज फ्रॉम नेपाल एंड फोरेंसिक साइंस फर्टर्निटी एंड आल्सो वी हैव गॉट अ पार्टिसिपेंट फ्रॉम ऑल ओवर द इंडिया एंड दे हैव कम अप हियर ऑफलाइन and some are there in online with us and we also have got a full participation from abroad they are joining us in online mode like canada the persons are here with us dr man sir is here with us from australia he has given so much time to us and thankful to sir nepal and usa so we have tried our best along with the organizing team so few deficiencies are there and next time uh, if we will organize a conference uh, or some type of cme we try to rectify it next time so i would like to in, uh, request you or advise you if anyone wants to join icfmt or spec the icfmt has a broaden the scope they have uh, earlier has got only limited 100 life members now that that has increased to the 300 now so if anyone want interested to join uh, the icfmt they will contact dr sk verma sir and if anyone wants to join uh, speak they will contact our president sir dr rk goyer sir and in all the two days yesterday i can say we have got a two gbms general body meeting of spic as well as of the icfmt and new office bearer bearer have been appointed i will congratulate all these office bearers especially that sk verma sir i say congrats to you and best wishes from my side and from our medical college i would like to thank all the dignitaries on the dais that sk singhal sir that op murthy sir that sk verma sir and that rk goria sir that besora sir that pankaj gupta and persons sitting in the audience that are from our college from the other colleges and few students are also participating here and my students and my organizing team agar main baat karu to mere department mein parivar chhota hai like main aur dr vinod hai yahan pe ha he is here mere department jo chhota hai that unke chhod ke chale gaye hame okay but the organizing team i have got lot of people and lot of volunteer lot of students they have not worked during the day which we have during the day time which we have seen there but they have worked day and night because i have seen and all we have witnessed this thing that before we reach here all the rangolis are prepared and not only the rangolis are prepared they have got a new message is written over there that have touched our hearts and two plays are organized here first one by the nursery students that is quite touching to me and yesterday by our mba students that is quite efficient and there is also a vulnerable and topic that should have to be we should have to think of it now today itself we also have got a play that is on the child abuse you will also get you have to think think and what uh, where we are going or being as a parent or being as a guardian are we fulfilling our duties or not so you will see after the this valedictory function one play is there so i will thank all sports staff my teen char log hai ye wale they are helping us sunil maharaj and sumit 
and Rahul. He is busy all the time. Whatever he will say, together, he, he will obey it. Okay. And then my all the friends that are come from Punjab, I can say, from other parts of India, they have got uh, not the forensic specialist, but they are from other fields. I would also like to thank the persons uh, or the do local doctors uh, who have come and uh, participated in the full spirit. And with this, all these words, I will end my speech and declare that this conference will end with this. Tigana. Thank you to all of you. हम भी दरिया हैं हमें अपना हुनर मालूम है हम भी दरिया हैं हमें अपना हुनर मालूम है जिस तरफ भी चल पड़ेंगे रास्ता हो जाए